So we've considered the cell cycle itself and how mitosis fits into the scheme of things. But now the question is, how is the pace of the cell cycle controlled? Because as we've already learned, it can move rather fast, or it might take a whole year for a cell to complete the cell cycle. This is a very active area of research. So the current view integrates two primary concepts. The cell cycle has two irreversible points. That is, when we decide to replicate the genetic material in S phase, the cell is sort of committed to division. And then the other part is where we have separation of the sister chromatids. The other concept that comes into our current view is that cell cycle can be put on hold at specific points, which we call checkpoints. The process is checked for accuracy and can be halted if there are errors. For example, if the cell is not ready to divide or there's some genetic disorder, there would be a checkpoint at the G1S boundary. Or if the DNA was replicated but it wasn't done correctly, then the cell would not be permitted to move through the G2M checkpoint. This allows the cell to respond to internal and external signals in order to decide if it's right to divide. So let's look at these checkpoints. There are indeed three checkpoints that have been identified. The G1S is where the cell decides to divide. It's the primary point for any external signal influence, like growth factors. We'll talk about those shortly. There's also a G2M checkpoint. This is where the cell makes a commitment to mitosis. At this checkpoint, the cell assesses the success of DNA replication. If there are errors, it won't be permitted to continue. And then the third checkpoint is this late metaphase or spindle checkpoint. This checkpoint ensures that all chromosomes are attached to the spindle and that we are ready to pull apart the metaphase plate. Now the question is, how do these checkpoints get regulated? Well, it's recently been discovered that there are things called CDKs, or cyclin-dependent kinases. Remember, a kinase is anything that phosphorylates things. So kinases go around and phosphorylate other molecules and activate them to do things. This is the primary mechanism of cell cycle control. When a cyclin-dependent kinase phosphorylates proteins that are involved in cell division, then we enter cell division. However, CDKs have to partner with different molecules called cyclins at different points in the cell cycle. So although there might be a lot of cyclin-dependent kinase around during G1, until it's filled with enough cyclin, the cyclin-dependent kinase is not yet active. Once the concentrations of cyclin increase and bind to the cyclin-dependent kinases, then the switch is moved and we can go on into the next section. For many years, a common view was that cyclins alone drove the cell cycle. That is, the periodic synthesis and destruction of cyclins acted like a clock. Because what we see in each of these phases is increase in cyclin, decrease in cyclin, increase in cyclin, and decreasing in cyclins. It's now clear that it's CDK in conjunction with the cyclins that allow this to happen. And in, in addition to that, the CDK itself is also controlled by phosphorylation. So it becomes phosphorylated as the cyclin joins the CDK. So it works much like this. Here we have the CDK, and CDKs are floating around in the same concentration in the cell at all times. However, the level of cyclin is up and down. And when there's not much cyclin in the cell, then you can't have the complex of CDK and cyclin. CDK is all on its own, and it can't do anything. However, when the concentrations of cyclin increase, cyclin binds to the CDK, and we have a cyclin-CDK complex. This is also called a mitosis promoting factor because it promotes movement from one phase of the cell cycle into the next and thus towards mitosis. The activity of CDK is also controlled by the pattern of phosphorylation. We have to have phosphorylation at one site 
inactivating CDK or phosphorylation on another site activating the CDK. I know this seems a little bit overwhelming, but it's one of the big areas of research in cell cycle control, and it's really relevant because it has all to do with cancer. Because after all, cancer is about loss of control in cell cycle. Cell division occurs much too frequently when things are not right. So most of the work on cell cycle controls has been done in prokaryotes, but as it turns out, some of the very same mechanisms exist in eukaryotes. There are multiple CDKs controlling the cycle, as opposed to just one that we see in the yeasts and bacteria that have been studied. But animal cells also respond to a greater variety of external signals. For example, there are growth factors that may tell the cells to go on into the next phase. And naturally, these more complex controls allow the integration of more input into control of the cell cycle. Let's look at a few other cell controls. So, as I've already introduced, cancer is about unrestrained, uncontrolled growth of cells. That is, they go through mitosis much too regularly, and often they have damage. So, cancer is due to failure of the cell cycle controls. As we're going to see, it's sort of like in a car, you're driving and you have a gas pedal and a brake pedal. But what if someone puts a brick on the gas pedal and keeps it forced to the floor? And what if someone puts a brick under the brake pedal so you can't push on it? This is exactly what happens to the cell cycle gas pedals and brake pedals in cancer. There are two kinds of genes that can become damaged and disturb the cell cycle. There are tumor suppressor genes, which, if they're functioning properly, should prevent the cell cycle from spinning out of control. And then there are proto-oncogenes, which are genes that, if they become mutated, can lead to loss of growth control in multiple different ways. Let's take a closer look at tumor suppressor genes. P53 is a really fairly well-known one that plays a likely role in the G1 checkpoint. P53 protein is a protein that monitors the integrity of DNA, so it's constantly around checking on the DNA and whether it's good or not. If it's damaged, the P53 enzyme halts the cell cycle so that the repair enzymes can be stimulated to fix the damaged DNA. If the DNA damage is irreparable, then the P53 gene directs the cell to kill itself, or apoptosis. And thus, it cannot pass on damaged DNA to its daughter cells. This prevents the development of cells that contain mutations, and thus prevents the generation of cancer. It's well established now that P53 is absent or damaged in many of the cancerous cells in a variety of different types of cancers. So proto-oncogenes are normal cellular genes that become oncogenes or cancer-causing genes when they have a mutation. So they are pre-cancerous genes. Oncogenes are ones that actually cause cancer. Sometimes that receptor can be mutated in the on position, so the switch is flipped on and the cell no longer depends on growth factors. So it's just on and continually going to be dividing. So as we've already learned, you have two chromosomes about a particular piece of information, let's say eye color. And in proto-oncogenes, only one of those needs to go wrong and have a mutation, and uncontrolled cell division can take place. So in that sense, it's a dominant mutation. If there's one copy of an on-light switch, then that copy can be made and it can be put out in the cell membrane and it says on for cell division. It doesn't need to have both copies of the gene mutated in order to have a profound effect. With tuner suppressor genes, both copies have to lose function for the cancerous phenotype to develop. So the P53 gene acts more as a recessive type of mutation. So in essence, we can look at this as if proto-oncogenes are stuck gas pedals 
and tumor suppressor genes are broken brake pedals. That's the easiest way for me to keep straight what's going on. The first tumor suppressor gene identified was a retinoblastoma susceptibility gene. This predisposes individuals to a rare form of cancer that affects the retina of the eye. If you inherit a single mutant copy of the RB gene, it means that the individual only has one good copy left. During hundreds of thousands of divisions that occur to produce the retina, any error that damages the remaining good copy will lead to a cancerous cell. This is called the two-hit hypothesis. A single cancerous cell in the retina then leads to formation of a retinoblastoma tumor because we have uncontrolled division of a non-functioning cell. The RB protein integrates signals from growth factors and its role is important in binding regulatory proteins and preventing stimulation of cyclin or CDK production. If cyclin and CDK is not being produced at a high level, then we have controls on the cell cycle. This figure sort of summarizes some of the proto-oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes that we're aware of. There are many more. A proto-oncogene would be like a jammed gas pedal. The cell cycle is just being pushed and pushed and pushed. However, tumor suppressor genes are like a stuck brake pedal, so you cannot push on the brake. So that brings us to the end of the material on cell cycle and cell division. Please spend some time on your diagramming now, so that if you have questions or curiosities about the language to do with cell division, we can clear it up, because in the next chapter, we'll have more things to sort out using the language. Probably the language is the most complicated part of this, so don't delay on making sure that you have a good handle on using the language. Talk about it. Let's take a quick card quiz. Cytokinesis is the division of the nucleus, and mitosis is the division of the cytoplasm. Is this true, or is it false? Spindle fibers attach to sister chromatids at the injecting mitosis promoting factor or maturation promoting factor into cells. If a researcher looked at a cell and noticed a straight line of sister chromatids, which phase would they be looking at? Here are your answers.